Hello, and welcome to the Albright Scholar for May 2021. My name is John Pankratz, and I teach history at Albright, and each month it's my privilege to welcome BCTV viewers and residents of Greater Reading to take a glimpse inside our learning community up on North 13th Street, to look at the work being done by teachers and students, and to think a bit about its impact on all of us. Well, as I said, it's May 2021, and we're at the end of a very challenging and in many ways exhausting and many ways instructive uh, school year. And I've invited one of my dear uh, colleagues, Maite Baragan, uh, professor of art history, uh, to come and talk about her teaching, uh, about some of her recently published pieces and about her ongoing uh, research as well. Uh, Maite, welcome to the Albright Hi. Scholar. Thank good you for having me. Good to see you. Thank, thank you for coming on. Uh, the May show uh, in the past has uh, featured uh, members of the graduating class, uh, but we're going to delay that for a month uh, because uh, uh, graduation happens in three weeks and we won't know until then uh, the various honors and prizes that our seniors have won. So I'll, I'll introduce our viewers to uh, some talented students uh, in the June show. Uh, but uh, how has this past year gone for you as someone who loves classroom teaching, someone who uh, wants students to engage with actual works of art as well. Uh, how's it gone? It's been, it's been difficult uh, for all the reasons that you bring up. It's been, there's been missed opportunities like in, for everybody else. Uh, field trips had to be canceled. I think that's the highlight of a lot of my courses, getting to have students after a series of weeks of learning about artworks, actually getting to see them, getting to kind of like feel the energy of a museum. So that opportunity disappeared, uh, as well as the fact that we have a lot of students working from, working from their own homes. So I also couldn't rely on having students just tell them, go to the Friedman Gallery which is something that I usually ask students to do so that they go into the gallery and get to see art in person. So those were, those, those felt very, I felt those very intensely. And I think, you know, you kind of have to come up with replacements. Um, so for my courses, what I've tried to do is introduce more of like public intellectual work. So for example, I've had students engage with documentaries from PBS, the Art 21 series. To right, kind sure. of, yeah, to give them a sense of actual working artists. And it's not, it's 100% not what I would normally do in, in the class, but I feel like this is a way to still bring in um, some new voices that don't, you know, like voices that aren't mine and experiences outside of the classroom. Although admittedly, like everything else in 2021, very screen centric. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That flat two dimensional, even, even yes. two dimensional art in a gallery is more than two dimensional. It, yeah, it, yeah that's there's a depth and there's a texture uh, to it that uh, stimulates us in ways that we can't really appreciate on the computer screen. Uh, yeah. I have to I have to tell you some very nice news. Uh, in my synthesis class, I asked students to go back and think about their gen ed courses and to talk about highlights and something that really struck them as a learning moment. And two out of my 20 students uh, mentioned art history courses with you oh, delightful. And, talked about, and talked about the experience of actually going into a museum and encountering a work of art and just finding something that struck their fancy and then learning more and seeing more into that work. Uh, and they just cited that as a transformative experience. So I thought that's, that was cool. I mean, that's the joy of my life, to be honest. And I think um, we talk a lot about museums in the, especially in the survey courses. And I emphasize this idea that these are public buildings and these are, it's such, such a privilege to be able to enter these places and that are precisely created to simply preserve and offer them to the public. Um, and we should both, you know, take advantage of that and also critically consider what it means to, to have a museum that has that role in society. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's wonderful to hear that. And again, I do, I, I miss the museum trips so much. They're, 
on my part, they're very stressful <laughs> because of I have to course, get Because sure. you have to worry about the bus and when yeah. kids get back on the bus in time. Exactly. On yeah. my, like, for me, they're, they're incredibly <laughs> stressful. I never get to, like, I always plan to, like, oh, I should see this section of the museum after I'm done giving, like, tours. And I hardly ever get a chance to do that. But, uh, but I still, the, they're such an, such an essential part of what I think art history can, um, art history does, right? So I, I'm delighted to hear that two students yeah. and went away with that. I think museums have gotten better at and better at explaining and contextualizing art uh, for their mm -hmm. viewers and for a really broad public as well. Yeah. Right. So they're they're not just for the cognoscenti. They're they're ways of making sense of what stu uh, what students what uh, viewers are, are are seeing and mm -hmm. making it more and more meaningful. Yeah. It's, yeah. One of those cases where thoughtful intellectuals are actually becoming smarter. Yes, I think, and ultimately, as academics, I think academics in the classroom, not in just researching in this kind of ivory tower imaginary world that some people think academics live in. Uh, as academics that engage with students, we know perfectly well that that's that's how you keep this is how you kind of like not only educate a public but keep them activated and engaged by actually reaching out to them so creating those opportunities and the museums have gotten a lot better about that and i think um i think students once they go into a museum and actually take note of the welcoming environment they're more you know it's just i know this place i can go back and i know what museums are like and i can continue to seek them out. And that's precisely what I want students to get away from, from my courses. Right. The, the challenge too is that uh, it's possible to look at works of art sort of in isolation or maybe in relationship simply to other paintings or sculpture in those genres. Uh, but as a historian myself, and I know you as sort of a social historian of culture, uh, the trick is to find the context. How does uh, art erupt in a culture? How do other aspects of society and cultural production uh, relate to artistic trends as well? Mm -hmm. so those interconnections are such an important part of what we try to do and I think what we hope our students will, will get. Yeah, well. yes, absolutely. I think the course that I'm teaching right now, it's uh, Art of Protest and it's precisely, I'm teaching it because of last summer's, of, well, last year entirely, but really especially during the summertime, those protests. And yes, I, we talk about art and the way that artists use art in, to crit criticize, to kind of resist or to like um, particular situations. But I also want to make sure that we're constantly bringing up news that are coming in precisely mm -hmm. because I want students to see like this is happening these forces are taking shape right now and these are things that are not simply isolated the artworks are part of society and society responds to them you can't have one without the other and you can't understand one without the other either um so yeah so it's this particular class it's very it's difficult and it's also particularly rich in conversation because of because of students just being just being alive and recognizing that we're living in a really difficult time. I think all of our students are sensitive to that. And I've, I've seen products in other courses that I teach where students are really struggling and working hard to make sense of, mm -hmm. of uh, issues of social justice. And yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think uh, to our student artists in the current show at the Friedman Gallery, which people are actually welcome to stop by and, yes. uh, and see you in person. Uh, a number of the students have taken on the challenges of this past year uh, and thought deeply in their own, own works. Uh, mm -hmm. those. Yeah. Yes. Well, you're, you're a, a student, a scholar of uh, another period of human history that is really fraught with controversy and lots of pain and lots of issues. And, uh, that's uh, uh, the cultural history of Spain in the 1920s and 1930s. Yeah. And uh, j just last month or two months ago, maybe you came out with a really wonderful uh, article uh, about uh, um, placing modernizing tendencies in 1920s Spain uh, in a broader iconographic and print culture context. 
Yes. Um, so that article came out of my dissertation. It was so it was a long time coming. But in the article, what I it's about dressmakers. This um, you know you can even call up a picture if you would like. Oh, um, I I mean, if you have it available, you can look at that. There we go. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So those are those are dressmakers and as per the it's a it's in the center fold of just a general you know like a popular magazine we would compare it maybe to us weekly something you would you know purchase that would be really affordable not an art magazine or anything of that sort mm -hmm. um that might be geared towards a more intellectual or elite public uh and in the center fold as per the description it says that these dressmakers are the joy of madrid and that they buy this magazine it's it's an advertising of the magazine inside the magazine itself uh, <laughs> that they uh, buy this magazine every every week. And that's kind of like the public that this magazine is delighted to reach. Um, and dressmakers and dressmakers were just like it. There was a huge labor force of dressmakers in Madrid. This was um, this was a workforce that was like the great majority was women. Mm -hmm. um and and it became like this dressmakers in madrid starting in the 19th century it was just like it became like a very local type of the of the urban center of madrid it was um textiles and dressmaking was such a big industry in in madrid at this point and the reason uh and that urban type has these associations of dressmakers being uh, in the 19th century, at least, these women that were uneducated and flirtatious um, and, and generally speaking, uh, pretty poor and yet really vivacious, etc. So there is this real stereotype that exists in Madrid during the 19th century. But by the time we get to the 20th century, we see that there is a sense that the stereotype is changing. These women are no longer mundane. They're becoming increasingly presented as urbane, right, like urban. So they are savvy, they are still vivacious and a little bit flirtatious as per the as per these stereotypes that continue. But um, but now they're they're very modern. They are these w working class women that are able to kind of be independent. And my article, what it does, it kind of situates this role of women in the modernizing city and, and considers what did it mean for not just any woman, but a working class woman to be celebrated in this particular way as very modern and independent? Because what we're ha what's happening in Madrid is Madrid is expanding, it's modernizing, and there's a lot of fear that comes along with that by certain people of Madrid changing and transforming, of a city perhaps kind of losing its character um, because of these modernized, like a modernized city might be more French or even American instead of Spanish. Right. Uh, They're traipsing down this wide sidewalk on really a brand new street that's been sort of cut through kind of the medieval heart of Madrid. Yes. It's this broad commercial boulevard. Yeah. Yeah, these are, yeah that's I mean, got to be scary to a whole chunk of Spanish society. Yeah, we forget, and it's it's fascinating because it's so it it's pretty his, it's historically really recent. But the idea of having like huge glass window displays this was the like the, so modern and so new. The idea of like wide sidewalks too it, it invites people to walk on it. People in older medieval cities, sidewalks are basically non-existent. People just walked mm -hmm. all over the street, and that was it. So just. The way that it's designed, it's designed for pleasure walking and strolling and, and to invite people to go into commercial spaces. And, and self display so as well. Yes, absolutely. I yeah. mean, this is, um, it's a place to see and be seen, right? Um, and this came very late in, in, in Spain, but especially in Madrid, uh, this was already the case in Paris, which has those famous boulevards. And we're familiar with, of course, like, New York and Fifth Avenue, but um, Madrid is very late to getting into this whole like modernizing and restructuring the city center. So in this particular image, it's this idea that working class women are able to take over this modernized, because um, they are, they're taking over the entire sidewalk and spilling out into the street. 
Uh, but the idea that these working class women feel so comfortable that are they're taking over these spaces where, I mean, the the sense is that they're not actually able to afford to shop here. Um, so they're they're these are hotels. Those are uh, department stores. So even though they can't afford to shop there, they're somehow kind of owning the space, mm -hmm. and that brings about a lot of tension for for some people that see them as perhaps just an inkling of the masses taking over Madrid and God forbid, <laughs> God forbid that the masses are, um, take control rather, take control away because it's always about who has control right now and who would mm -hmm. lose it. Uh, take control away from those elites and those um, moneyed or wealthy or educated classes that are supposed to control the city. And of course, there is a conservative uh, reaction uh, yeah. to all of that in Spain in the 1930s. Uh, I thought of this article, I thought of you as I was watching uh, the Ken Burns documentary on Ernest Hemingway and, and, and some of the footage, actually a film that Hem Hemingway hel helped to produce on the Spanish Civil War uh, in, in the 1930s. And yeah, he was staying on that very street, the hotel where he stayed at during the Civil War. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and then we 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 think of uh, uh, revolution and uh, and counter revolution in in the American context uh, as well as we we swing from one extreme of the pendulum uh, pendulum to to another mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now you have uh, f future projects un underhand as well, right? I do. Uh, so this is uh, so this kind of participates in my interest of more thinking more about working classes and working class uh, material culture, as well as not just material culture, but just like cultural artifacts, visual arts, visual culture as well. Um, so my next project is going to be on Puerto Rico. I already have I already have an article that I've written that is currently under review. And that one deals with a traditional, it's a huge monumental painting. It's over eight feet times 13 feet. It's enormous. <laughs> but uh, so that's, uh, and it's from the 19th century. Uh, it's from the 1893. And, but the painting, however, even though it, it kind of fits like our traditional definition of what an art historian deals with uh, what's interesting about the painting is that it depicts peasants, Puerto Rican peasants. And this is the first time that Puerto Rican peasants had been so monumentalized. Um, it's an island that was over 80% of the people that lived in Puerto Rico worked as peasants uh, for the coffee and sugar uh, industries. And um, and the idea is that that kind of let me, the, the scene itself of this painting, the painting is called The Wake by Francis Goyer, uh, mm -hmm. but the scene itself of this kind of glimpse into peasant life um, led me to kind of think more about other ways that I can introduce more traditional and folk artifacts and give them an art history uh, evaluation so currently I am, I'm interested in the future as I, I kind of like slowly tread into this project. I'm thinking about taking, um, hopefully being able to take some training in oral history mm -hmm. um, because I would like to introduce conversations and interviews with craftsmen or craftspeople, craftsmen, mm -hmm. craftswomen. Um, to give a sense of the actual labor, what these, um, not just a description of, not just a description from having like read about it, but actually having a conversation with people that might speak to their labor, how they see their own task and introduce, um, and introduce these, what we would usually call like these folk art works within a, within a, a book that is ultimately going to be about a visual culture of Puerto Rico. Um, it's still very early in the stages. So if I'm not making that much sense, it's because it's not making, it's not quite making sense yet here. It's, uh, it's definitely 
I think for myself, I don't know if you can, you can agree with this, but for my, for, for me, one of the most exciting parts of the project is when you're not sure what you're going to be treating or dealing with. And it gives you an opportunity to just like engage with so many different things and people uh, and go to museums. And that's kind of how my dissertation came together. I just went to many places and things that really struck me, I kept, I kind of like kept in a file in my head. And as I just kind of, yeah, as I, I gathered a greater sense of like other things that were going on, the, it, it just crystallized for me. So I'm very excited about the, like doing that in Puerto Rico, kind of like going back, I'm, you know, I'm from Puerto Rico. So going back home, but with this kind of idea of like an open-minded, what strikes me and what's actually going to stay in my head kind of spinning around for a while to see what can come out of it um but that's right now how i'm envisioning it kind of like introducing introducing new his new oral histories within this project yeah as um i find myself thinking uh, to what french examples of french cognates you said it was a painting of awake and i'm thinking of Courbet's monumental uh, painting of the the funeral at Arnon. Uh, yes. And oh. again, uh, his his work was to integrate uh, peasants uh, as subjects of paintings, not not simply background or something like that, but as uh, human figures with their own subjectivity and experience. And Francis Goyer worked uh, alongside Courbet when he lived in Paris. So it's definitely we see those. Yeah, that evocation, that evocation is quite possibly a reference um, as well. And the there's, I, and, and it's so interesting though, because that painting, it's what I discovered uh, while it's, this was all done during pandemic research. So it was also limited to digitized artists, like archives. Um, so within all of these limitations, it, it was actually really interesting because what I was able to discover was how um, how different the way that this painting was perceived when it was first presented in 1893 is to how we perceive it today in Puerto Rico. It is a monumental artwork. It's considered to be like this national painting of Puerto Rico mm -hmm. because precisely because Puerto Ricans, a lot of people have family that is, you know, that has peasant roots. Uh, you can't get rid of those 80% uh, peasants that lived in, in Puerto Rico in the 19th century. So it's become this, this central painting to the discussions, but at first it was seen precisely as you described Corbet's painting, it was seen as very distasteful. Like, why are you, why choose this subject out of all the other subjects and why not only choose the subject, but give it such a like scale, like a yeah. literal scale. Yeah. Um, and so, and so it was fascinating to kind of understand that the painter himself comes from, you know, he's very intellectual, he's incredibly well educated, has traveled to Madrid, has traveled and, and worked in Paris, and he goes back to Puerto Rico and creates this monumentalized version of a peasant wake. And it's, it's interesting as it kind of paradoxically in monumental, like it literally monumentalizes them, but it also seems to honor these, this peasant lifestyle while at the same time pointing out all the things that really remarking on all these things that people like himself found to be really backwards about these peasants. The fact that they are, the fact that they are bringing in food because there's a, there's a roast pig that's being brought in to, uh, to eat while there's a wake going on, these kind of sanitary kind of um, etiquette rules that are not um, acceptable for the bourgeoisie. For the, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, and I re really encourage you on this oral history tra trajectory. Um, when Diderot was working on his encyclopedie in, in the 18th century, he, he was really frustrated by craftspeople. Uh, because he, he, he wanted to re reduce knowledge to a rational presentation in his images and in his words. And very often craftspeople couldn't quite say exactly how and why they did things. Uh, they could show it and they could tell stories about it, but it wasn't uh, as uh, laid out and rational as, as he wanted it to be. Um, 
so yeah, I think uh, some of the truth and some of the understanding can only be passed on in those oral conversations rather mm -hmm. than um, laid out in some methodical way. Yes, and I think, and because we started this conversation speaking about museums um, and the sort of like actually being in front of an artwork, how that changes and shifts your understanding of it. And I think of that with, if I'm talking about making, um, I need to at least actually engage with, like I might not become a great craftsperson, but the idea that I should at least experience materials how and see them through the eyes of someone that knows what they're looking for when they engage with them. Um, because personally, I have like I don't. <laughs> I just can't. I can't speak to that knowledge. I can. I can speak of something that looks finely crafted, but I can't really notice what it is that a craftsperson would note um, would notice. Um, and all of that is just time spent with material and time spent working and time spent recognizing that certain things are more difficult than other things. So I would love to kind of get a sense of that for the sake of like local local craftsmanship. That's great. And of course, we now, now all carry uh, high quality recording technology with us in our pockets and bags and, Indeed. <laughs> and everything like that. That was not always the case in, uh, in times past. Um, we are going to be in person uh, next, uh, next fall. That's the plan uh, to welcome students onto campus and to have uh, classrooms, uh, you know, we're going to be careful and, and safe, whatever uh, the guidelines are at the time. But I hope that a vast majority of uh, students and colleagues are, have been vaccinated and that that's working for them. And uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing students face to face uh, in the fall. Uh, wh what are you going to be teaching uh, next uh, late August? Late August, I will be teaching my and that is that is my dog shaking her head. Okay. Uh, if you the dog on Zoom always. <laughs> always. Uh, the this uh, fall, I am going to be teaching the art history survey, the first part, which is takes us from prehistory all the way until the medieval times, so the 1300s. Um, but globally speaking, so it's always fun. Um, and I'm going to be teaching art history of an art history course of Latin American art in the 20th century, which is also always a delight as we get another tour of, <laughs> of different countries uh, across Latin America and what's taking place in the 20th century. Yeah. And finally, I am very excited to be teaching a first year seminar, the How We See seminar, which is, um, it is not an art history course. It is instead asking students to engage in different ways of understanding the visual world by taking on different concepts. That is to say, it's, it's kind of a theoretical without calling it a theory heavy class, mm -hmm. but it is kind of engaging with questions about how we see gender, how we see race, how that has been historically different, how we even see nature, like what differentiates the human from the non-human. Um, and, and yet we also get to see a lot of fun visuals, which is always where these ideas kind of play out for us. So. Oh, that, yeah. that's going to be fabulous. Yeah. Uh, it's not as though 18 year olds haven't been inundated with uh, visual information, right? That's, yeah. that's the nature of our, our society, but to be able to step back and to uh, apply an analytical lens and saying, why am I noticing this? Why is this being represented? Mm -hmm. Something else isn't being represented. Uh, to bring mm -hmm. that critical thinking in uh, is, yeah, that's that's what college does. It is. I, I love that course. Um, every single year I've had students, I've only taught it twice, but uh, both years I've had students, I had no idea what this course was about. And yet it has completely transformed how I understand X. Um, so for example, a lot of students were very impressed uh, by discussions about how race, like how this concept of race was something that didn't exist and how it suddenly came into being and how now it seems to, and it's very challenging for many of our students as it would be for any 18 year old who is just kind of understands the world from what they've perceived, but kind of 
re recognizing that the way we see race in the United States is not the way that people see race in Latin America or Asia, et cetera. Like these differences are very real and nuanced, like, mm -hmm. and, and I think that it's an opportunity for students to kind of engage with stepping into other cultural ways of understanding these concepts that they think they understand right but they understand it through one very like a very narrow scope of reality which is you know everyone's own that's right yeah well i'm, I'm certainly looking forward uh as well uh i think we've reached the end of our time although i didn't put a stopwatch on us uh so I thank you, Maite, for, for, for sharing your ideas, your experiences in the classroom, your experiences uh, in, in publishing some lovely pieces and pieces to come uh, as well. And best of luck with the final three weeks of our semester and with graduation. And uh, we'll try to see you over the summer as well. Thank you, John. And it has been a delight to speak to you. Great. And it's been wonderful having you with us as well, folks. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you in the month of June with another edition of the Albright Scholar. <laughs>